All right, this is Into the Absurd, episode number six with Jamal Lixet. He is a philosophy professor at the University of Idaho. So what all do you teach at the University of Idaho? So yeah, thank you for, for letting me you know, come and chat with you. This is exciting. Um, so I teach uh, mostly ethics. I teach uh, um, ethics, business ethics. I teach some history of philosophy. Um, so this semester I'm teaching modern philosophy. I teach ancient philosophy. Uh, I'm also interested in um, Buddhism and teach a Buddhism course and um, existentialism in, in 20th century continental or European philosophy. So those are my, I guess, my main interests um, and the, the courses that I teach. Um, and, and critical thinking. I can't forget critical thinking. Yes, I teach that every so often. So. so with Buddhism, I just read part of the, the Bhagavad Gita. And that's, I understand that that's Hinduism, but I know that the Buddha was originally a Hindu, right? Or is that wrong? No, no, that's, that's definitely true, right? He grew up... Um, as a, in, a, in a sort of a ruler uh, leader class um, in, into you know, what was then sort of a, um, it was Hinduism, but what we call Hinduism today, um, you know, just sort of the religion at the time, right? And, and so, but yeah, we would look back at it um, and we would say that, the, that he was you know, doing devotional work as a Hindu um, and and he, he sort of saw, his, his, his father saw, um, his family saw that, that there was some, some aspects of Siddhartha, um, which is his name, uh, before he became the Buddha, um, that were, were very spiritual, right? And, and he, he spent a long time studying the uh, spiritual paths that were sort of open um, during that time, which were, were both Hindu and um, Jain. So that's where he started, um, but yes, he was a he was a Hindu, um, and the Bhagavad Gita, yeah, it's very interesting, um, the, the kind of dialogue that goes on there. <clears throat> there are a lot of a lot of aspects of that I think that are um, that are very relevant to Buddhism, right? Because what what the what the Gita sort of teaches us is that we have to live a life that is is rounded, right? That we we cannot sort of step back from action, but also we need to be involved in, in meditation, in ethical practice, um, in devotion. All those sort of aspects of, of a, a spiritual life are important. Uh, and Buddhism, you know, it, it really says the same thing, that we have to sort of have a full, rounded out life. If you look at like the, the, the Eightfold Path, right, it, it contains each of those components. Um, it contains meditative components. It contains ethical components, um, and it contains um, components that, that have to do with with understanding, with belief. Can you remind me of what what the eightfold path is? Sure. Yeah. So the the eightfold path, um, and we sort of think of it like we look at it. I think from from the West, we look at it as like a list. Like you start here, and like you end um, down here, and we really want to think of it as um, as all going on at the same time. So it starts off with this this idea of right view. Um, so right view meaning that you you have an understanding of the eightfold path. Um, you have an understanding of the um, the four noble truths. So so the four noble truths um, saying that that the world is filled with suffering, with pain, with dissatisfaction, with craving, all those sorts of things that that we, um, we, we, we sort of fall into suffering because we become attached to things, right? And I think it's really, you know, it's pretty obvious in, in sort of the modern world, right? We, we have so many things that sort of grab our attention, right? And say like, you need to do this, you need to follow this, you need to like, um, you know, so you, you, you know, you, you spend a lot of time on social media and if you put that away, you put that down, like you can feel right the like dissatisfaction in your life you can feel this like anxiety going on you can feel um it, it sort of has taken over in a sense um and there are a lot a lot of things that 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 has happened to you know to our lives right we're all filled with those sorts of things and Thumbs. so so the, what's that 
phones. Phones, just phones. Yeah, I mean, it's just like yeah, everything to do with the cell phone. Um, and and so the Buddha says, well, yeah, so that's like the reality, right? Um, and 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 so then the Buddha says, well, what's like the cause of that, right? What what's creating that sort of suffering, that anxiety, that all that like tenseness that we all walk around with? And he says, well. I mean, what it's about is we get hooked, right? We crave, we desire those things. We want things when they're good to remain the same, um, not expect any sort of change. We want things um, when they're like terrible, like, you know, we want to like blot that all out. And, and we, 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 so then we, we start craving like all these like often material things, um, sometimes our relationships. Uh, we could, Comfort. It's, it's, yeah, and essentially we become addicted, right? We, we live a life of addiction. Um, and, you know, we all sort of have our things, but we live a life of that, and we want things to remain um, sort of constant. But it's, ex, it, it's we're reaching outward for that, right? Like, that's what we tend to do is reach outward, not inward, um, to find that. Um, and so that's where the, the, the trouble comes from. Um, and, and so he says, well, there is an end to this, right? There's, there's a way for you to end this sort of cycle that has, has, has sort of trapped you. There's a way out of it, to, to, to be free of it, to be liberated from it. Um, and that he calls Nibbana, um, or Nibbana in the, the Pali, the original, or the earlier language of, of Buddhism. <clears throat> and, and he says, okay, and, and the way out, right? There is a way out, so I, I, I'm sort of promising you there's a way out, um, but I'm also going to tell you how to get out. Right? I'm not going to say, like, figure it all out on your own. I'm going to give you some, some practical tools to, to live with, um, and that's the Eightfold Path. And so the fourth noble truth is the Eightfold Path. And so the Eightfold Path begins with this right view, um, that we, we sort of have a proper understanding of the universe, the cyclical nature, the changing nature, right? I mean, the core sort of message of Buddhism in terms of physics and metaphysics is like the world's constantly changing, right? And, and so we can't grasp onto anything and expect it to remain the same. Uh, That's kind of where that, um, that quote that I was saying to you earlier in the Bhagavad Gita mm -hmm. with the, uh, the I, I am come is time, the waster of the peoples, right? Mm -hmm. It's like yeah. nothing in this world lasts forever. Right. Yes. Yes. And, 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 you know, Indian, Indian religion, whether it's, it's, um, Buddhism or, um, you know, Hinduism, Vedantic religion, um, you know, it all sort of recognizes that, that there is a, a change and it's just where they find the permanence or they find the way out is very different, but, but they, they all sort of recognize that, that change. And you sort of look at the, the sort of the, the trinity of, of Hinduism, you know, you have that sort of creation, uh, you have that sort of sustainer, and then you have the destroyer, right? And it's this like cycle, and it's a recognition, and, and so those go on in these sort of big epics, but I think it's also a recognition that that's going on all the time <clears throat> in a small way throughout our lives, mm -hmm. right? We, you know, things become new, and we sort of keep them around for a bit, and then they get old. Break, they fall apart, um, or we discard them. Right? They no longer are useful or helpful to us, and so we discard them. Um, and so it's just a, a practical way, I think, of, of observing the world and and learning to be okay with that. Right? Learning to accept that is a is a way to um, to peace. You know, until you can accept that fact that that. The world is constantly changing and it's out of our control like we can't stop that like there's nothing we can do right the world's gonna do its thing there's nothing we can do to stop that um, and sort of accepting that is, is one of the, the first sort of elements of, of becoming okay right it, alleviating all, a, a lot of that stress that anxiety um, you know people people I think think about that when they're happy, when things are going great, like they often remember like, oh, this is gonna come to an end, right? They like, there's that little bit in the back of their mind, they're like, oh, this thing is gonna, and so we become like tormented by that. We can't just enjoy what's going on. 
but then we suddenly forget it when things are going terrible, right? Like when things are going terrible, we suddenly forget that like things are going to change and, you know, it will come back to being okay again. Uh, and so we, we sort of just, um, we become our own enemy in, in that. Um, so, and then we move on. So there's right thinking as well. Um, but then we move on to the, the what I would say were the moral parts of the Eightfold Path. Um, and um, so we have a, um, right speech, I think this is all right, um, right um, action and right livelihood. Um, so right speech would be, uh, so it'd be, a, it'd be like a two part thing. Um, you're gonna have, you're gonna have both, um, you know, honest speech, but also what we call skillful speech. So the, the Buddha, I think has a, a much more nuanced view of, of um, sort of honesty, uh, of truth, and where it's not something that like we we engage in just to like say okay I'm never gonna tell a lie I'm always gonna you know tell the truth, and I don't really care like how that impacts people, right? Like as long as I'm not lying I'm okay. Uh, the Buddha says, well, it's not quite that simple, right? Don't, don't try to like um, claim that it's that easy because your words have impact. And, and so they're, first of all, they're, if you do need to tell the truth to somebody, right? If you, if you, and, and he's obviously going to advocate telling the truth. So if you, if you need to speak to someone and it's information or it's something that, that may um, cause them harm in some way, but it needs to be told, you can ask a few questions about that, right? Like, you can say, well, do I really, like, how, how can I say this to the person? Like, are there ways in which I can communicate this, which would be, you know, kind and gentle, right, compassionate? Um, and, and you can think about the time, right? Like, when's a good time to actually, like, communicate this information um, to another person? Um, is, you know, are there, are there better times or, or worse times um, to do that? Um, you know, and, and any, and, you know, anything else that can, can kind of create a, a compassionate sort of element in, in the use of your, your speech. And this isn't just about like, you know, telling like difficult information, but just in general to be skillful, um, with our speech. Um, you know, we can also like kind of become attached to our speech. You know, the Buddha talks about like, sometimes we just don't need to talk, right? We can just be silent and that's okay. And we don't need to just sort of fill space like uh, with, with talking. Um, and, you know, we can ask about because the, 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 the one thing that we attach to the most and the, the Buddha, this is sort of the hard thing that people can't swallow very easily is the self, right? We get attached to the self and for, uh, for the Buddha, um, the self is that like last little or big thing, right? That we, um, we we can't quite give up. So so that's the so so right speech. We also have right action, which is the we get sort of the moral code. I would say of Buddhism. Um, so like you know don't don't kill, don't lie, so on. Um, and and then we have um, right livelihood, which is an incredible sort of aspect of Buddhism, which says like we need to live the kind of life that will benefit the world, right? So our our work. And then finally, we have the meditation components of Buddhism. So right efforts, um, right concentration, um, and um, right mindfulness. Concentration is a huge aspect of Buddhism. Mm -hmm. um, with the, uh, so I just recently started uh, reading the Dhammapada. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, concentration. So there, there, there are these two sort of ways of of engaging in, in meditation, two types of, of kind of meditation uh, that go on in Buddhism. Um, and they, they serve very different purposes. Uh, we can sort of see one as maybe training for the other. Uh, so there's one type of meditation which is intended to allow for, um, allow for, for you to, to sort of understand you, yourself, and the, the world, right, the universe. Um, you know, to, to come to a true understanding, a deep understanding. But prior to that, right, um, and, and perhaps in, in conjunction with that is we really need to train the mind. Like our minds flitter all over the place. Like we, we, 
we are constantly being you know distracted uh, by this and that and if you've ever tried to meditate like or just to sort of sit quietly like it, you notice that, that it's, it's pretty quick that your your your, your mind sort of stepping in like there's some sort of thinking that comes in and and sort of floods out the mind right and really wants you hard. to wants you to like focus on that and, and buddhism says like that's okay right that's what the mind does right but the, the the process is is letting go of that right sort of saying you know yes i'm thinking i see that i'm thinking um and then just let it go um, and so one way of, of sort of helping with that is to develop um, deep concentration or develop a, an ability to concentrate, right? Because it becomes you know, sort of your energy of the mind becomes trained uh, in, a, in a certain way. Um, and so the, the most common way of, of doing this in early Buddhism is, is probably using something like the breath. You can use all sorts of things. Like the most common is to use the breath and just following the breath, using the breath as a point of concentration. So you remain with the breath as it comes in, right? And then you remain with it when it goes out. And, and you just sort of do that just over and over again. Um, and that becomes a way of, of, of learning um, concentration. Um, sometimes you can use sort of mantra-based stuff as a, as a method of concentration, where you have a short phrase or something that you focus on. Um, you know, there's a, a, a sort of a, a, some advice that's given often in India about meditation. And these types of meditation are common to, to you know, most Indian religions where if you have an elephant, right, um, and you bring that elephant through the marketplace, right, um, and there's, you know, fruit stands and, you know, all sorts of stuff here and there. That elephant is going to be picking stuff up all the time. You know, it sees something it wants to try and like will grab it with its trunk, uh, and then it'll get distracted and grab something else, and it's just going to make a whole mess of the marketplace. And so when you you walk through a marketplace with an elephant, what you do is you give it a stick to put in its its um, uh, trunk, right, to hold onto it. You take that set, same elephant through the marketplace, and it just walks through. And so learning concentration is sort of the same thing, right? It's a recognition that our mind is constantly sort of doing this stuff and it gives the mind something to do, right? The mind wants something to do, like it wants to think, right? That's what it wants to do. And so it gives the mind something to do as you're sort of um, walking through. Um, and so, yeah, so concentration is, is really important. And once you've, you've developed that, right, it becomes much more easy to do, you know, what what um, some Buddhists call like insight meditation, like the ability to, to learn more about ourselves, to sort of open ourselves up um, because our, our mind has, you know, emptied itself in a sense or, or become, become maybe not emptied itself, but become more at rest, um, settle down. Um, yeah, I've tried, I've tried mindfulness. I try to do it every other day. Mm -hmm. It's really hard. Yeah, I mean, it can be, it can be hard. Right, like, and I, I one thing I'm really happy about is is the the amount of um, the amount of information, the amount of like tools that people have now for meditation. Um, you know, to to have um, all of this sort of guided meditation, I think for a lot of people that's a, a good way to enter into meditation um, is to use uh, some sort of guided, um, uh, you know, guided program that will, will help you through different forms of meditation. I think Netflix has put up, uh, I think it's called Headspace. I could okay. be wrong, but it's some guide to med guide to meditation where they guide you through the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Every episode is oh, cool. just a new aspect of meditation and mindfulness. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, so that, and I, I, I use, um, it's called Insight Timer, um, so it's, a, it's just an app on your phone, and I use it for the timer, but it also has, like, a lot of different teachers are on there, um, and if you want to pay, you can do, like, courses and stuff, too, but it, most of the stuff on it's free, so, yeah, there, and there's just a ton, ton of apps, um, yeah, 
so that's that's been great um you know but at some point you got to give that up right you got to let that stuff go too um because at, at the end of the day like it, it's about looking into yourself um and you know and i i think that we we resist that a lot like it's it's kind of scary to look into ourselves um so are you mean we have to let uh, let what go Oh, I was meaning at some point, like, let the, the guided stuff go, right? Yeah. And sort of sit by yourself. Um, mm. and, and, and I think that, you know, the guiding is really important and can be really helpful for a while, right? Um, but, but, again, it's another thing we can become attached to, right? Um, it's another thing that, that can sort of can, if, it, if it's held on to too long, I think can become a crutch. You know, makes it sort of impossible to sort of move to the next step. Um, you know, I mean, if you think about what the Buddha was up to, we sort of have mindfulness meditation these days, or mindfulness, like that whole idea of mindfulness, which is important. But if you think about what the Buddha was up to, right? The Buddha was after complete liberation, right? Complete liberation, total transformation of the self. Right? You are not going to be the same person. Um, and, and so, like, if you follow the Buddhist path um, and, and are, are working towards that, um, I mean, you have to, you have to, at the end of the day, do the work yourself. Um, that's one thing about Buddhism. It's a very, even though it's, there's a lot about compassion, um, you know, and, and, and loving kindness and all those sorts of things, there's, there is an element which is, is very individualistic in that, you have to, you know, he said, he said at the end of his life, right? Um, when he was about to die and enter into what they call the parinirvana, right? The nirvana after death. He was about to enter. He was sort of speaking to, to his followers and said, you know, I've, I've laid out the Dharma. Um, now work out your own salvation. Um, so, so there is that, that sort of, um, you know, that aspect. And I think it's, I think it's just honest, right? I think he was just being honest that no matter who the teacher is, right, you can have a teacher and that, that teacher can be really important. You can have a spiritual advisor, um, you know, whatever, but, but like they can't do the work for you. Mm. Like there's at some point where each of us has to sort of t take that on and, and commit to doing it ourselves. Um, it's a poor, it's a poor repayment to the teacher if you remain a student. Mm -hmm. Right, right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Because the teacher, what does the teacher want? Well, the teacher first of all wants wants you know you to achieve that fulfillment, um, but also like to be a teacher as well, or to, to sort of step out and like you know do good in the world and, and, and teach others yourself, right? And you can't do that in, until you've you've worked it all. Have you read Siddhartha by Herman Hesse? I have, yes. Yeah. yeah. I just thought that book, after I read that, it really gave you a total understanding of what the Buddha would have went through, or at least from Herman Hesse's perspective, mm -hmm. right? Because um, all these people were going around and they were following the Enlightened One, right? Mm -hmm. And then Siddhartha said, no, I'm not going to follow him. I'm not following anyone. I need to find this out on my own. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a really, um, that's a really good sort of bringing together of Buddhism and, and existentialism. <clears throat> um, and yeah. And so the, the Siddhartha, um, in, in that book, right. He, he is not the, the sort of historical Buddha, but he sort of lives this parallel life with the, the Buddha and his friend, that started off uh, with him, right, remained with the, the Buddha, the Enlightened One. Um, and, and the one thing I like about that, um, too, is it, I think it also sort of points out the accidental nature of spiritual enlightenment. Um, you know, like, we live a life where we think we're in control of that sort of thing. Like, Siddhartha thought, like, no, I'm in control of this thing. I'm going to go figure it out on my own, right? Um, and we find that 
the you know this great spiritual seeker was susceptible to you know materialism um, you know and, and became wealthy became very attached to that wealth became very attached to his, his spouse um, and you know what did that lead to right well it led to despair in the end um, you know it led to despair where he was near suicide and and we, we see that it's in that despair, right? So the thing that, that he was not trying to aim for, right? That exactly the opposite of what he was, was aiming for at the beginning of his life. It's in, it's in the despair itself that we, we, we see the beginnings of true spiritual awakening happening, right? That's where his journey actually began. Um, so the important was, I mean, yeah, he could have he could have followed the safety of the Buddha, which he chose not to. Um, but but beyond beyond the sort of leaving the teachings behind, like being guided by another, um, which was an important um, step for for Siddhartha. Um, beyond that was the the sort of you know he was not controlling his own enlightenment. He thought he was controlling his own enlightenment, right? But he wasn't. And it was at the point of, of losing it all, um, giving it all up, that he began, right? He gave it all up, that he had to go through this point of, of basically death um, before he could start. Um, and he let go. Yeah, he was forced to fully let go of everything, including himself, right? That was the thing, is he had to let go of himself. And so I, I love that teaching because I think it it reminds us too that that even in the midst of, of getting caught and doing all this stuff in our lives, which we you know we might realize, oh, this is this is you know totally leading me in the wrong direction, um, you know, spiritually. It very well could be exactly the teacher that we need. So his, his seeking wealth and, and privilege um, was exactly the teacher that he needed. Um, you know, not that he realized it. Um, he had to understand what it was like. Right? Yeah, exactly. And, and had, to, had to understand what it was like to be in that point of despair too, right? So both ends of it. And, and, so, um, and so then he was able to let go and be free. He was teachable, right? If you remember, he he met the um, Vasudeva. Ferryman. Yeah, was it? What was the name of the ferryman? Uh, Vasudeva. Vasudeva, right? Earlier, right? Wasn't ready for him, right? It was only later when he re when he was now prepared to hear, you know, his teachings, hear the river, you know, all of that. Um, yeah. Um, you know, that all sort of reminds me, right? Of, of sort of the, the spiritual path that like um, that like twelve step recovery um, is teaching right in a lot of ways like like the the addict is all about that attachment so just just like Siddhartha was attached to that life of of of, of wealth and all that right of of and, and basically a, a a not worrying about anything real. Right. He was living a life where he didn't have to worry about anything real. Um, but he became attached to that, right? Like, like addiction is, 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 in some ways, is about sort of avoiding what is, is real um, about ourselves and about the world, right? Or trying to avoid pain. Um, and eventually it gets to the point where it's, you know, not really avoiding pain so much as. Oblivating ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. Day after day, right? That's what it, that's eventually what it turns into. Um, there's a point where, where where it's just about, you know, shutting the world and oneself like totally out. Um, and so there's this idea in, in most most you know twelve step programs where it's like the sort of idea of the rock bottom, right? Where where we hit like the rock bottom. And so Siddhartha had to sort of hit his rock bottom, right? And so it was at that point of hitting the rock bottom. You know, you can't start moving up until you hit that rock bottom. Um, and, you know, 
and sort of have that major failure, major major despair, or whatever it happens to be. And 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 the the point of that rock bottom too is like it's not just hitting a rock bottom because there's always a lower bottom, right? Um, is also somehow being prepared to hear the truth, right? Because if you're not prepared to hear the truth yet, like that doesn't really matter, right? Um, and so and so like for some reason, like Siddhartha was was prepared to hear the truth at that moment. Um, and, you know, I think we see a society where a lot of people maybe have those moments, um, but, but perhaps are not, you know, prepared to hear the truth. And it's not something anyone can do, you know, for another. Um, yeah, I mean, sometimes it kind of needs a, like a slap in the face. I mean, maybe metaphorical, mm -hmm. but. Sure. And then you kind of, whoa, what have I been doing? Yeah. Right, where am I? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and so then it's just, yeah, and that's what prepares us for like the work that then becomes necessary. Um, so I know that there's a lot of similarities between uh, Nietzsche's work mm -hmm. And Eastern philosophy, right? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so n yeah, uh, there, there, there are similarities um, between the two. Now, I, I, it's it's always complicated when we we try to compare Nietzsche to, <laughs> to anyone, um, or when you even try to interpret Nietzsche. <laughs> try to yeah. interpret Nietzsche. Um, yeah. Sometimes you just gotta let Nietzsche, you know, just just be himself. Um, <laughs> and, um, but I, I, I think, I think, you know, one of the major sort of places like where they, they really come together, um, that maybe this is all just true of existentialism in general, um, you know, is, is sort of a, a Um, a way of sort of seeing how all of the um, sort of metaphysical constructs, the metaphysical truths that we have sort of held on to, that we've built around us, um, you know, these sort of the sort of conceptual framework that we have created, where we see like the good, and um, you know, we have the sort of notion of progress, where you know, certain, certain types of ideas of a deity. Um, you know, all these things are, are really, the, according to Nietzsche, and also according to a lot of Eastern thought, is like just ideas in our minds that we've created, um, that we, we do for, we, they, they're, they're escapes from the real spiritual work that we have to do. Um, and, you know, and so, so both of them, you really see this, like, if you, if you read... Um, thus spake Zarathustra, right? Like you see how um, uh, Zarathustra in that, you know, his, if, if you remember at the beginning of that, right, uh, sort of Nietzsche says that the reason that this book is, is you know, about Zarathustra, like the reason that Zarathustra becomes the, um, you know, the one that's on this sort of um, journey is because Zarathustra was the one who established the ideas of right versus wrong. You know, sort of in, in world history, at least as Nietzsche, right? That's where we find a very strong, um, in, in Zoroastrian um, sort of thinking, um, Zoroaster, or also known as Zarathustra, right? That sort of established this right versus wrong, this sort of, this, this sort of dichotomous, way of thinking about the world where we split light and dark and all those things right um and then he kind of walks along and then he looks back and he thinks well i was i was kind of wrong mm -hmm. right he says he was wrong and he says that like he's caused problems because of it like this sort of this is like i need to repair what i've done you know uh, and and so 
And so he, he does that, right? He, he already tries to. Like, he doesn't think he's actually able to. He, he says that he is not the overman himself, but he's preparing the way for the one who's able, who will be able to overcome, right? The idea of the overman, I can think about all sorts of weird ideas about that, but the overman is just the one who's able to overcome this way of thinking, right? It's to, to no longer be constrained by this dichotomous thinking anymore. And, the, and that reminds me of the Buddha. Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the Buddha definitely um, wanted to get outside of, of that dichotomous thinking as well, right? Like, um, that, that way of organizing the world um, is, is very unhelpful. Um, um, you know, even where we do have moral sort of positions within Buddhism, those moral positions are, are that it's recognized that those are um, kind of just means to um, to helping us like along the way, right? They're they're practical, right? They're they're not handed down by God or anything, right? They're <clears throat> they're just sort of practical things that we ought to engage in, um, and uh, in order to, to sort of help us become you know better people, prepare us for um, for you know achieving nirvana and so on. Um, it will is acting in an unrighteous way an unvirtuous way of being evil or hurting other people insulting them stealing all those things will only bring you more suffering right yeah so so the so buddhism talks about like these core um these sort of core problems um if, if you've ever looked at um the, the center of like that wheel of life um that tibetan um, thing where it's got like um, it's got a roost, rooster, pig, and a snake right in the center, uh, and then it's got different elements on the way out. Th those three are, t are talking about what what Buddhism calls the the three poisons. Um, so it's um, um, hatred. greed and delusion, right? Hatred, greed, and delusion, right? Those are the three things which keep us suffering, keep us attached. Like that whole wheel is like the, the wheel of samsara, the wheel of, of existence, right? That's the, that's the wheel that the Buddha is trying to get you out of. Um, and that's those three things that keep you inside of that. And, and so, um, so those are sort of the, like don't do those things because they're they're keeping you attached, right? Um, and and so the the antidote right to those things um, is just the opposite, right? So you have um, you have delusion, right? Well, you ought to seek wisdom, right? Wisdom and understanding, um, right? You have you have greed, um, um, you know, you ought to you ought to, to seek generosity. You have um, hatred, you ought to seek loving kindness, right? And so that's the way you ought to live your life is according to, to those three things. And so those the antidote to the poison of, of the, the greed and the hatred and the delusion. Um, but those are practical, right? So as I just said, like, um, you, can just, you can sort of think about it. If you just sort of think about what greed, hatred, and delusion do to you, right? No one feels very good, you know, uh, when they're, they're practicing those habits, right? Um, and, and they're really just sort of a black hole that we fall into, right? You know, greed gives us, you know, leads to more greed. Um, hatred leads to more hatred. You know, delusion. Uh, if you follow down a path of delusion, it's never going to lead us to truth, right? It just leads us deeper and deeper into a world of, of, of falseness. Um, so, so that's that's what sort of the Buddhist approach. Um, you know, I, I think what's interesting is so you compare that, right? So if we, we look at Buddhism and then you look at that that part in um, of the state of Zarathustra with the, um, was it the, the lion and the camel and the child? Oh, yeah. And so you think of like, um, we have that like lion stage of like, tearing things up, um, right? Versus the, the 
cattle stage, which is all about like um, you know following the rules, doing what's right, um, and like neither of those um, are the way out. Um, so it's not about following rules, but it's also not about just pure destruction, right? Although that might be necessary for like a cleansing. Um, but it's, it's the, the third stage of, of living the life as the child, living this life of innocence, where there are neither, right? Beyond good and evil is another one of Nietzsche's books, right? Where there's neither good nor evil, right? Like you're living in this place where, where it's just about, you know, joy um, and that's it. And being evil, or at least in the classical term of the word, will not be a joyous existence for you. Oh, sure. Right. Right. Yeah, like, you know, cruelty and evil, you know, brutality, all those things certainly will not bring you to joy. Um, so then one, in trying to break away from this suffering, Nietzsche proposes that we should just become a child again. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, be that creative spirit, that creative force, and then come out into the world with our ideas and come out to the world with our creativity and our joy and our happiness mm -hmm. and be honest and kind to other people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that's, that's um, you know, at least the, the reading that I have of that. And, you know, and it's, it's interesting that, like, so many, you know, like, sort of spiritual, um, like, disciplines um, really emphasize that, you know, that sort of childlike existence. Um, that, and that the, the sort of the creation, right, of good and evil um, is not, you know, sort of living in a world in which, which we, 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 we sort of, organize our lives or sort of structure our lives under this sort of dichotomous like good versus evil um, existence is not um, is not the, the sort of the path of, of you know enjoyment of, of, of fulfillment of being really human right to being truly human um, you know you sort of see in Genesis right it's it's you know, you have the, there's something that happens when we become aware of, when we, we get knowledge of good and evil, right? In, in um, the beginning of the Bible, um, you know, something occurs there and it's not good, right? <laughs> it's not something that, that we want. Um, You'll suffer. Forever. And we suffer, yeah. And the life of suffering. I had an interesting thought about that, about Genesis. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if, if there's any interpretation of that, of Eve taking the apple and eating it, of that being not just the knowledge of good and evil, but that's also being representative of obtaining conscious thought, right? Moving mm -hmm. from being in these tribes where we're all happy and we're innocent, and mm -hmm. then now we have this conscious thought, and that conscious thought, that'll punish us forever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. Um, you know, I, I think there are interpretations along those lines that have been given. Um, that, you know, there's some Freudian sort of interpretations, and Bataille has a, a very similar um, sort of interpretation um, where it was, you know, in, in the Garden of Eden. Um, we were living essentially, I mean, according to, to Bataille, we were living the life, sort of this natural life of, of existence. And right? everything was perfect. And everything was fine, right? We had all we needed. Um, you know, we lived in groups that were pretty small. Um, you know, so so the, the sort of the social aspects, um, the sort of social anxieties that we get today, uh, were not the same then, right? Um, you know, they, they, we, didn't, we didn't have those sort of, that fear of like all of the people, right? Because we knew most of the people that we came into contact with. Um, and, and so, but yeah, life was a, a very different sort of thing, at least socially. Uh, and, and that when we 
what do we sort of became more populous and uh, especially when we entered into agriculture, if you remember, right, what is what happens, right? What's the punishment um, that that is sort of laid down on Adam, right? And that's like, well, you're gonna have to till the land. And so this idea of when we move to agriculture, right, when the population becomes large enough that we, we begin to to have to grow food um, to make it, right? There's like something that occurs then. Is, is somehow correlated, and at least in the, the book of Genesis, with um, losing our innocence um, and, and becoming aware of what's right and wrong. Um, so, yeah, there is there is something, and then that sort of the idea of like conscious thought, right? The word conscious and the word conscience, right? They're not all that far apart. And, and so it's, it's very possible that, like, you know, that idea of consciousness and also our conscience. Right, this feeling of, of what's good and what's bad, right? You know, they, they seem to be um, you know, somewhat associated for us as, as human beings. I guess it's this, uh, right? Like he eats the apple, and and at that moment they realize, oh wait, we're we're naked. Mm -hmm. There's snakes in this garden. There's there's all this danger around us. Mm -hmm. Like so, like what are we doing? We need to put on clothes, we need to protect ourselves, we need to uh, make sure that we have enough food for next year, so let's go start farming, right? Mm -hmm. It's just, uh, and that kind of relates back to, back to Buddhism, where, you know, we're worried about all these things that are happening in the world, and we're thinking about these things, and oh, this is good, this is bad, right? And if you let go of all of that, everything will be okay. Yeah, and, you know, I think that, that you know, something that, that you sort of mentioned is really important, that, like, we, we started having to do those things, right? And so that means that, that we, have, we have all we need already, right, in, in terms of, 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 of trying to achieve awakening. Right, it's already there, you know. I mean, it's like kind of like the Zen, um, the, the, the sort of Zen Buddhists say, right? We're already awake, right? We just need to realize it. And so, um, there's no radical distinction between um, Nirvana and Samsara, between suffering um, and and Nirvana, right? Uh, and and enlightenment, and 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 that's because we already are right there's this sort of sense that like that's our that's our natural state right our natural state is enlightened right that's that's the, the that's the real state um and all the rest of this is false right um it's it's a it's not it's not real right it's something that that has um, come to control us and we take to be true reality um it does things like cause us guilt, right? If we don't spend enough time doing all those things we're supposed to be doing, right? Um, then we, we feel guilty. Um, we, we you know, think of time as like this, this like commodity, right? And, um, and it's like, well, no, it's not. Like, in some ways time's irrelevant. Um, and, and so, so it's, yes, yeah, so when we talk about letting go, right, we're, we're the ones that are holding on to those things. So this idea of letting go is that we hold on to them. And all we have to do is sort of open our hand. Um, but, you know, that takes development and things like, you know, concentration and, you know, meditation and all that, all that sort of stuff, because it's become so much a part of, of who we are. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's tough to, to let that, that stuff go. Yeah, just letting go kind of of your ego and your sense of your sense of attachment to all these these earthly pleasures and all these earthly pains that we see every day. Like, oh I gotta get to work at twelve thirty. Mm -hmm. Oh no, I'm gonna be late. I mean obviously you should make sure they get to work on time, but <laughs> but not just because you 
have to go to work and you think, oh, I have to be there. It's more so, well, I'm choosing to go to work at 1230 because when I get there, I'm going to make a lot of people happy because uh, the person that was working earlier, he gets to be off. Mm -hmm. And now I get to go do whatever I do at work and make my boss happy, right? Yeah, I like that you, you sort of caught yourself in that, you know, because we can sort of think about that. Like, what these people are saying, so people like Nietzsche, perhaps the writers of the Bible, I mean, even within the New Testament, you can sort of ask, like, you know, is what, what Jesus is saying here, like, is it, is it sort of anarchistic? Is it, like, you know, relativistic? Um, and, you know, you look at, at you know, the Buddha, like, is he, is he claiming that, like, Standard morality is like problematic. You know what's really going on. You know, do, do all these these teachers are they are they advocating for something that is um, you know amoral and you know unconcerned with any sort of morality. Um, and and I think that like and this is where this is where it's important to. Be careful about sort of throwing around this idea of nihilism. I think um, because nihilism has this this sort of meaning to most people, where um, it means like like getting rid of um, you know like destruction, uh, and and I don't I don't see any of these thinkers as being nihilistic um, in that way. Um, you know, you think of Nirvana. Nirvana is a blowing out, right? It means to blow out. So there's a, there is something, right, that's being blown out. Uh, I think if there, if it's an annihilation, it's a, it's like selfishness. You know, I mean, that's required first. Um, you know, because if you don't do that, right, yeah, this does turn into something pretty ugly. Uh, because then you can just do whatever you want. Who cares, right? Like, um, so long as you're holding on to the self, right. Um, like there's there's just really no way to uh, to sort of live these ethics or these these different standards or these different ways of living I guess I should say right um, you know because the, the, the ego now I don't know about Nietzsche what would he say about this um, even he I think um, you know he talks a lot about power and stuff but 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 even he I think you know, would say that a certain type of egoism is is very um, problematic. You know, I mean, he emphasizes the self in so many ways, but but you know, if we have a like the, the, the final stage is not is not the dragon, right? Not the destruction, um, but neither is the final stage. You know, the camel. Right, the final stage is, is this thing that it seems to child, which seems to not have a fully developed ego yet, right? Um, not so concerned with um, self in the same way that, that we we tend to do. So I, um, yeah. So I think that there there is this sort of like, are we leading? You know, are we we sort of wanting to lead down this path where where we are just sort of throwing everything out. Now, now I think a more important question um, is, do, do we need those rules in the first place, right? Do we need to live a life where we have developed a strong sense of morality first? Um, and later we can, we can learn to, to move beyond or overcome that way of living, right? Do we need to live that, right? So in the sense like, did, did Siddhartha, right, need to go through the time of studying with the Buddha, um, you know, doing all these things, right? Could we just walk out of, like, the room and become enlightened, right? Or do we have to live life in a certain way and be constrained in certain ways and then overcome those, cons those, those um, restraints on, on ourselves, hmm. right? Um, well, I think as soon as you break into any society, even a, even a tribal community, mm -hmm. you're immediately struck in with, hey, you have to live this way. You shouldn't be doing that. You know, like we live this way. We do, we have these traditions, we have these beliefs and you should have these beliefs too, right? Mm -hmm. 
and you know, e even if a child was born and raised by wolves, for instance, the child would see how the wolves act and he would live with the wolves, right? And it's kind of, I think, part of enlightenment is breaking out of this, uh, this bubble that we put ourselves into, these, uh, these restraints that we that were locked inside, inside of society, right? And inside of our cultures, our religions, our beliefs, our traditions, and all of that is kind of, we're in this kind of this prison cell, right? And we can't break out of it. I think enlightenment is kind of breaking out of that jail cell of, and getting rid of these, this attachment to all these different systems. Mm -hmm. What do yeah. you think? Yeah, I think so. Um, I think that 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 you know what you know, what enlightenment is about um, is overcoming that or breaking out, right? I think it's because it's freedom, right? So this idea that freedom that you were we're, we're freeing ourselves from all of those constraints, um, you know. But I, I wonder, and I think it's I think it's probably true, and I. I I read this guy named Richard War. He's this Franciscan priest that lived in New Mexico, and he talks about um, a lot of this, where where we need that sort of growing up time, where we have um, certain rules and structures and things that that we are are a part of. Um, we need that at the beginning of our lives. Um, we need to, a sense, build the ego, um, and hopefully build it in a healthy way, right? Um, for us to um, move beyond it, right? So we sort of need the path through um, through this ego building, and then and only then, right, will we have what, what's necessary to push against, um, to step beyond, right? And because you can't break away from your ego if you don't have one, right? To begin with. And there seems to be something, and I don't know what that is, but there seems to be something different about the child, like the Nietzschean child, after having lived through those stages versus like, you know, a child proper. Like the Nietzschean child, um, I think is more joyful, having broken through all of that, having come, become free of all those constraints. It's kind of like that, that happy old person that's really honest, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah, and I think it's right. I think I think there's a I think maturity, right, and wisdom are important. Um, and, and I also think we have those those stages in our lives um, where where we just want to destroy it all, and that's per and I think that's a perfectly natural and helpful stage in our lives too, right. Um, you know, we grow up, we have these things, we have these constraints, we maybe leave home, spend some time like enjoying life, um, being free from from our, our, our childhood in a lot of ways. And, um, you know, maybe we're, we're adopting new values, right, of success and, um, you know, whatever. Um, but, but there's a, a sort of transfer or shift in, in values. Um, and, and I think we have to go through the, the destruction of the, of the, the prior ones. Um, it's kind of like this idea of like our, our relationship with our parents change changes, like from when we're kids, like the teenager like relationship with, with parents versus like the, the, the adult relationship with parents is very different, you know. Um, we come to, I think, I think in a sense, we come to appreciate our parents more much later, you know, we maybe don't appreciate them quite as much when we're still living at home. Uh, and, and it's, it's later on that we, we come to appreciate them and we can begin to like, we're not, not like resisting our parents in quite the same way as we did. Right. So we can, we can have a, 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 a much more open like relationship. Right. I mean, this is very like, you know, I'm, I'm saying in a very traditional sort of sense, right? I mean, obviously we all have different relationships with parents, but, um, but, but I think that there's, it's a very different sort of 
a sort of relationship we have. And, and I think that's related to this, this like we've, we've given up certain things, right? We've, we've done that work. Um, and you sort of see how like this, these like things are sort of natural stages in our lives. Like we all have to go through these things. So, so you also delve into um, philosophy as a way of life. Mm. I remember when we first, when I first invited you to come and do this, you said that, that was one of the things that you're yeah. confident in, and, yeah. and you spent a lot of time thinking about that. So what, so what's all that about? Yeah, good. Yeah, this is good, and this is actually what we've been talking about in a lot of ways. Um, yeah, but just not directly. So, uh, so, so. So philosophy, right, if, if you sort of, like, ask someone on the street, you know, what's philosophy about, you know, people, people give all sorts of answers, um, you know, but, but usually people will have this idea of, of just sort of, like, people thinking hard about stuff, about ideas, and discussing those ideas. Um, now, certainly philosophers do that, right? Philosophers think hard about ideas and they discuss them. Um, but philosophers also, uh, and this is this is looking back at, at ancient philosophy, sort of the, the origins of philosophy in the West, in, in Greece, um, as 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 this very new way of living. Um, you know, most people like were devoted to um, to the, the the gods of of their their particular city or area um they you know went did you know went to all the festivals they sort of just did the things they were supposed to do um philosophy steps in and begins to provide um a certain way of living um and so what do we mean by this right what does it mean to say that philosophy like look at philosophy as a way of life so the the philosopher uh, if you look at the the, the old schools, like the academy, which was established by Plato, or the Lyceum, which was established by Aristotle, um, or um, the Stoic school, right, um, which was um, uh, established by Zeno of Citium, uh, or, or, or the Epicureans, who, who hung out in what they called a garden, um, just outside the, the city of Athens, established by Epicurus. Um, what these these philosophers, what they, they saw that they were doing is they saw that they were, were bringing individuals into their schools, um, you know, into their fold in a sense, to, to, to live a certain life. And so there would be, like, so at Plato's Academy, right, it wasn't just like, you go to school for four years, get your degree and leave, right? It was this whole like life process where there would be older students, um, who were there spending time with younger students? They were people who lived there for years, uh, and and they were you know sort of doing the same sorts of things each day together, um, you know like there would be you know various meditation practices. There would be obviously dialogue. There, um, you know, there would be um, you know some of the, these schools had like journaling that was was required. You know all sorts of things that, that were sort of part of the life of the philosopher. It was also a life of, of sort of asceticism for most of them, meaning giving up of the, the sort of the, the standard um, uh, uh, sort of sources of pleasure, right? Like um, um, giving up the kind of the worldly stuff, right, in order to to engage on in, in, in sort of truth and living a a good and ethical life. Um, most of these figures, actually, which is sort of interesting, were, were vegetarian. Um, you know, they gave up, up meat because of its harm, and, um, and so there are a lot of a lot of sort of like aspects that were were an important part of of philosophy. And to be a philosopher meant that you you picked one of these schools, right? You you entered into the practices of one of these schools. Uh, and, and, and so, and so that's, that's sort of this idea of philosophy as a way of life. 
Now, the, the classic in terms of, of, of sort of looking at philosophy this way is stoicism. Um, you know, sort of living according to a certain set of virtues uh, and, and performing certain certain practices that, that help you become you know, unattached to the world, to those parts of the world that, that are, are, are sort of weigh on your passions. Um, you know, it's interesting that the a lot of the, the sort of practices of the Stoics are similar to practices of Buddhism, where they both, and actually the, the Epicureans have a similar sort of practice, where they, they have you meditate in one form or another um, on death. You know, perhaps be like thinking of yourself as a corpse um, and, and be, you know, learning to be sort of okay with that. So a lot of these things, the, the sort of, um, you know, show up to, to help us become, um, you know, I, I, I can use the word happy, but like, but I mean it in, in not like the, the, the modern sense. Um, content. Content, content, fulfilled, yeah. I think, because there is a difference, because... You know, you could be happy, you know, just feel joy as you walk through your day. You know, maybe something good happened to you. But I think being truly happy is also just feeling good about having bad thoughts. Hmm. Right? Kind of hmm. just, uh, like, you know, I'll always tell my friends when they ask me, oh, how was your day? And I'll, I'll always say, oh, I had a good day. You know, some bad thing might happen to me. Maybe I showed up late to a class or maybe I lost my wallet or any number of bad things could happen in a day. But at the end of it, you know, I'm okay with bad things happening to me. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's good. Learning to live in such a way that, you know, that, that if bad things happening happen to you, you're going to be okay. And knowing that you're going to be okay. Um, and yeah, I think that's that's the good life, right? Like, um, because you're right, content, as you said. Um, you know, and, and, and that way of living does not say, it does not say that bad things aren't going to happen, right? Um, it just says that should bad things happen, I know how to, to live with them, right? Yeah. And to... To not, um, you know, not become attached or or averse to, right? Push away, um, you know, those things. Um, yeah, I think that's 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 a really good way of thinking about um, happiness in the way that I, I have in mind. It's okay to feel sad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's okay to be anxious. It's okay. It's okay to be angry every now and then too. Yeah, now that that's something that's important. I I, I agree. Like I think that a, a full range of emotions is really important. Um, there are those that look at Buddhism, you know, and it's uncertain how good Buddhism is with that with with the emotions because there's it seems that there's at least ways of interpreting Buddhism where there's a lot of I mean there's so much detachment and 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 just sort of like letting everything go where. You no longer fully feel emotions, and I, I I agree that like feeling the full range of emotions and being okay, right? Like that's that's for me, you know, what I, I find to be important. You know, I don't want to be emotionless. Yeah, well, I think uh, at least the way that I interpret a uh, Buddhism, it's mm -hmm. it's more like in the first line, you know, there's that. He robbed me, he beat me, he defeated me. And it says, those who quell themselves up with this will not be happy. Sure. Right. Yeah. And I think, yeah, you can, someone can rob you and it's, it's okay to be angry, but it's not okay to be attached to your anger. Yeah. I think that's, yeah. that's the main thing. I think that's true. And I think that. Like, and we're really good at that, right? We, we're really good at, at, like, living out of anger. Like, we love it, in a sense, right? Um, and, um, and, and, 
learning to sort of like say, okay, yeah, because because otherwise you're like suppressing your anger and you don't want to do that, right? Like, and so you allow your anger to come up um, and let it let it pass away. Um, yeah, I, you know, I had a therapist that, that talked about this where, um, and I, I think she was sort of quoting somebody else, but uh, that talked about how like the healthy way to, 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 to have our emotions is to have them like, you know, a three or four year old child has them, where they become like almost exaggerated compared to like how like adults react, right? They become they're, they're really felt, like they're those emotions are truly felt, right? There's 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 anger, there's yelling, there's real sadness, right? Like you know, you start bawling over anything, uh, but there's also like real joy and happiness, you know? You like feel this full. Um, full range of emotions um, and young children like it's really amazing to see how little you know they sort of hold on to things um, you know like grudges and those sorts of things don't really make sense for kids but like if something bad happens to me especially if it's somebody close to me you know like someone I love like, I'm going to be all off and, like, you know, you know, sort of silent or not want to, like, deal with the person for, like, a day or two, you know? For a kid, it's, like, 30 minutes later, they're fine, right? So they felt the emotion fully, and then it's gone. Um, and, and I think there's, there's a healthiness to that, where allowing ourselves to feel emotions fully, right, let them fully play out. Um, I think we just... I think the, the process of, of not allowing our emotions to, to sort of play out, I think that, that um, that's pretty pretty dangerous and, and that leads to a lot of suffering, I think. Mm -hmm. right? It simmers down, you know. Well, it's like controlling the weather. Yeah, exactly. You know, you, you can't control the weather. No matter right. how hard we try to control the weather, it's, it's impossible. Yeah. And you can't predict it either. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. But, um, so a child, in a sense, if, if the mind is the atmosphere, they just let it rain, they let it snow, they let it be sunny, and they don't worry about it. Yeah, yeah. And they just move on to the next thing, yeah. So, yeah, I think that, That, that I think any, any sort of like thinking that resists emotion, um, you know, I think, I don't know, I really struggle. I mean, it's like Kant, right? Kant, I have a hard time with because Kant is so focused on reason, on rationality, and doesn't really have a place for emotion. Yeah. Right? He's kind of the Western parallel of Confucius, right? Sure. Yeah, that's a pretty, that's a pretty good comparison, I would say. This, this idea of duty. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. It's all about duty. Um, I mean, I think, I think duty is, in, is important, mm -hmm. but you shouldn't be attached to duty. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, like, sure, you, like you have a duty to, I guess I'll use the going to work example. You have a duty to go to work, right? Mm -hmm. But if, if, something happened like like you broke your leg and mm -hmm. you might be thinking well i have a duty to go to work even though i just broke my leg well no you don't your mm -hmm. leg just broke you won't even be able to go to work mm -hmm. right and i think uh you can kind of detach you can have duty but also kind of make it in your mind that you're also free yeah. Yeah. Another way of thinking about that is sort of to go the opposite end, um, the opposite sort of extreme, which is, um, you know, somebody, somebody like, uh, like, like, um, um, Derrida, like Jacques Derrida, like he talks about this, um, idea and he gets a lot of this from a, a philosopher, Emmanuel Levinas. And, 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 and the idea is that like, yes, we have duty, right? But the thing is, is we have a duty to like everybody all the time, 
right? So there's this like constant duty that's that's sort of calling to us. And so, you know, you're driving to work, so you use that work example again. Um, and, you know, you get a call from somebody that needs your help. And it could be something really serious that like, you're just like, yes, I'm gonna turn around, I'm gonna go like do it now. It could be something kind of middle of the road. Um, you know, like maybe, you know, maybe somebody um, needs a ride to something important and they're not able to find one yet. It could be something very minimal, right? Um, um, you know, maybe that person needs a ride to like go get a pack of gum, you know, from the store, right? So these duties are like all over the place. Um, and and, and obviously your work, right? And those, uh, those are who are, who are at work with you, right? They have a, 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 a say too, like in all of this, right? So you owe a duty to them. And, and so you have all of these duties sort of going on constantly. And at any moment, like any action that we do um, is a sacrifice of all those other duties, right? We're, we're never in a place where we can fulfill all of our duties. It's just impossible. And, and so we have to sort of see in our actions that we are sacrificing and leaving behind others, right? And, and on the other hand, we, we, we can't sort of dwell on that um, and not be present, right, um, with the choice that we make. So there's this freedom in it. Like, we make the decision, we make the choice, and we have to, to sort of um, um, grasp or, 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 or recognize and, and honor that choice um, uh, but we also have to sort of you know remember that that um, there are all those others that we we you know could be with that we have, have chosen not to be with you know I mean for example like you know my kid is um, at daycare right now right um, and so but I have and I have a duty to him and and so there's a sense like oh well you know I'm sacrificing like my my time with my child right now, um, but I you know have a duty to you, um, and and so I have I've chosen right like I've made this choice um, to be here, and in that there's this sort of sacrifice that has occurred. Um, now obviously that can be paralyzing, right? If you sort of like think about life in that way, um, you can just become <laughs> paralyzed. You're like, oh, I can't make any choice, you know, because I'm going to like hurt somebody. Um, but, but also I think it's, it's, you know, it's sort of being honest in the sense of like, like this is just what our life is about. Mm. Um, and is having to, to make these kinds of choices. And I think if you, Kind of going back to Buddhism, if you kind of let go, mm -hmm. then your heart will kind of bring you to the right choice mm -hmm. when it comes to all these duties, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I think that's important. Yeah, I've I've, I've found that when you know when I can slow down, um, you know, and and yeah, allow my heart. You know, some people you know might call this their conscience. Some people might call it like God dwelling in them, you know, whatever it is that's going on. If allow, if you allow it to just like be there and speak, like, yeah, usually there's a wisdom, you know, that we can, we can, um, allow to, to guide us in life. Uh, for all you out there, if you have any questions or you want to suggest someone to come on the podcast, um, just email it into dot the dot absurd dot podcast at gmail.com all right thank you very much take it easy all right